I am always recommending and encouraging young researchers to apply for scholarships and mobility programs because it's going to help them for their career and to build a network and to develop their connections. So it's going to be a great experience during their research stuff. So I highly encourage them to apply for mobility programs. Hi, I'm Stephanie Tumampos and you're listening to Down to Earth, the show where we talk to incredible geoscientists about their science, their careers and their passions. Now fasten your seatbelts and get ready for takeoff because we're going to travel. Support for Down to Earth comes from the Inspire, Develop, Empower, Advance, or IDEA Committee of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society. The IDEA Committee is devoted to empowering engineers and scientists from diverse backgrounds to follow a career in geoscience and remote sensing. One way they do this is by pairing established and emerging geoscientists through their Women Mentoring Women program. In this year-long mentorship, careers blossom and friendships are born across generations, disciplines, and geographies. To learn more and become a member, visit grss-ieee.org slash community slash idea. My great mentor is not in the ge- geoscience field because I was blessed with a great mentor who is my father. This is Dr. Shaima Shabani. She's a computer engineer and remote sensing scientist. Her work focuses on adapting the computer science techniques of digital imagery and artificial intelligence to the requirements of natural hazards monitoring. He supported me in my education and my career choices. He was always pushing me to uh, move forward. People say that parents greatly influence their kids. When Shaima was completing her engineering diploma in computer science, she got the opportunity to conduct research at Le Centre de Développement et de Recherche en Imagerie Numérique based in Quebec, Canada. Please forgive my bad accent. Getting back to Shaima, there was a slight problem. Shaima had never traveled before. Thankfully, her father had her back. At the beginning, I was not really sure if I want to go alone to Canada and to do a project of six months there. It was not only the first time that I traveled, it was the first time that I moved outside of the house. I mean, even in Tunisia, (laughs) because even in Tunisia, I studied in um, the university, which is not far from my house. It's in the same city. So the first time when I went outside of my home, Uh, It wasn't to go to Canada. (laughs) It was really tough. And I hesitated many times before doing it. But of course, because my father was with me at that time, that's why I was able to do it. So the first time you left home was to move from Tunisia to Canada? That's crazy. Yes. Actually, I remember that in the beginning, in the first uh, weeks, I returned at home and I was crying. I told him, this is very difficult. I'm not going to do it. I want to go back. Let's go back. But I remember then he he was uh, really serious and he said, no way, you are going to continue what you are doing. He refused to go back and he was really pushing me to continue. And I'm really grateful for this moment because Because of this moment, I know that I can do many things, even if inside of me, I know I'm I'm telling myself, stop it, stop it. But because of that moment, I know that I can move forward. You know, that's a huge decision to actually move out from your home to another unknown place. I mean... You know Canada, but you know you don't know how the culture works, how how everything in the city in Quebec yes. works. You know, and the weather and... also. Oh, how did you manage with the weather? <laughs> how did you find it? Actually, actually, we we went there in uh, April, but even in April, we still can't see the, the the snow. There is a huge amount of snow there. We had to wait until. May or June to have this uh, kind of uh, sunny days, the, the days that I prefer in Tunisia. 
No wonder you were ready to come back after a week in Canada. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But it was a good experience overall? Of course. It gave me a great experience to work in research center with all the required uh, materials of cameras, high definition cameras and motion trackers. So it was a huge thing for me because this was the first time that I saw the uh, motion capture studio and I saw how they are producing the video games in real life. <laughs> video game studio. And you know, I discovered this passion from the uh, motion capture studio that of the research center in Quebec because they had really good uh, high definition cameras and I was able to see the recordings. So I said, this is really amazing. I want to do it. So I started my training in photography. I did some self-training and some courses here in Tunisia. And that's it. I'm enjoying taking pictures. It sounds like the whole experience was the start of a few passions for you. Photography, the practical applications of research. And of course, you caught the travel bug, didn't you? Mm, yes, actually, during my PhD, I had many opportunities. And I'm really grateful for that. The opportunities of trainings and mobility programs. I did an internship in the Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, it was about learning the basics of hydraulic model building. Uh, also, I was selected in the context of um, iTech mobility program to attend the course on uh, remote sensing image processing. It was in IRS in Dehradun in India. Uh, I had also an Erasmus Plus ICM mobility in the University of Trento in Italy, where I explored the capabilities of deep learning in the context of uh, post-flood soil deformations. As you can see here, actually, um, these mobility programs and internships helped me to develop my interdisciplinary skills. So you've traveled a lot after Canada. Yes, I was able to do it, yes. I, I told you because that moment with my father really helped me after to uh, build my personality and to empower myself. That's amazing. Just knowing that this one moment changed your whole life, it's incredible. Yes. Okay, let's just back up a bit for a moment. I want to talk a bit about your start in computer engineering because this focus is what led you to the trip to Canada. What drove you to pursue computer engineering? Uh, I thought that actually computer engineer career is a career that can help me after to be, for example, researcher and apply this knowledge for uh, the research. Because having the uh, computer science tools will help you to do whatever you want after in research. So... Uh, when I decided to be a computer engineer, I said, okay, I'm going to have some general tools. This can help me after to improve myself in other domains. So you studied computer engineering and ended up working on video games for your graduation project. What happened next? Um, when I had this experience of Uh, seeing the application of what I have learned and seeing the uh, importance of uh, this information for a real project, then I decided to look for another project who is... Actually, I was looking for uh, the application of what I have studied in computer engineer into reality. And that's what led you to focus on the environment and flood mapping in particular, right? For your PhD? Um, as a PhD, I, I was looking for a, PhD, a good subject for PhD that can really motivate me. And I was really eager to apply my knowledge in something that can be useful daily in our daily life. So when I found this subject, this uh, PhD subject of flood monitoring, and I can use all the uh, skills, my computer science skills, I said, okay, this is something that is good and I can see the impact on reality. Uh, I can see how 
um, it can have a positive impact for the environment, so I want to do it. Coming up, we dive into the specifics of Shima's flood mapping research, which involved an incredible number of different remote sensing techniques. And don't pack your bags yet, as Shima also shares to us some important wisdom she has gained as a result of her extensive travels. Worldwide, women remain underrepresented in the STEM workforce. That's why the IDEA Committee of the IEEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society has developed a highly organized and incredibly rewarding mentorship program for women. Through this year-long program, mentors support mentees in setting goals, problem-solving challenges, and celebrating successes. For mentors, it's an opportunity to share expertise with the next generation. And for mentees, it can mean the difference between staying in geoscience or leaving the field. To keep going as someone who didn't come from a science background, um, having those mentors who saw promise in me meant a lot and, and truly helped me navigate specific circumstances as they arose. Consider offering your expertise as a mentor or bringing your enthusiasm and questions as a mentee. Visit grss-ieee.org slash community slash idea to sign up. Welcome back. Today, we've been speaking with Dr. Shaima Chabani, a computer engineer and remote sensing scientist who loves to combine her diverse skills and knowledge to solve real-world problems. We've also discovered how she's an avid traveler, all thanks to one fateful trip to Canada as part of her engineering degree. So one thing I have to say before we get into the details of your research, congratulations on defending your PhD. Thank how you. does it feel to finally be done? Um... I'm feeling really uh, free. <laughs> uh, I'm feeling this sense of freedom because, you know, when you are a PhD student, you always have deadlines, you always have projects, reports, uh, papers to write. So the fact of at the end um, having all of this done and successfully, so I'm really uh, feeling this kind of freedom. Now I can, actually, I had the opportunity to enjoy this summer. <laughs> what was the first thing you did after successfully defending your PhD? <laughs> um, I had the family lunch, a big one, with my family members. Actually, with the family members who, who were able to come. Because, as you may know, we had the, the problem of the lockdown, of coronavirus, etc. But at the end, we tried to enjoy the moment with my family and friends. That sounds lovely. I'm glad you were able to celebrate even with COVID. I also heard that you won a three-minute thesis competition. That's incredible. What motivated you to do that? They say that if you are able to present something in a short period of time, it means that you really understand it. And how did it feel to do the three-minute thesis competition? Uh, I was stressed. I felt, uh, yeah, I was really stressed because, but you know what? I said, it's okay, I'm going to try. It, it doesn't matter even if I don't win, it's okay. But at the end, I, I was able to make it. I'm definitely getting a sense that you're good at motivating yourself to try new things. Speaking of which, flood mapping was pretty new to you as a topic. So can you tell me about it, your PhD thesis? The main objective of my PhD was to develop flood monitoring tools uh, that will map the flood water extent. But not only that, we also worked on uh, monitoring the ground surface displacements that are triggered by flood water. Because you may know that uh, the uh, conventional methods for flood monitoring are based on the recordings of measurements, uh, of the measurement stations. But this is not efficient because in the context of flood circumstances, um, it's not easily um, reachable and safely reachable to go to the flooded zones and acquire the data, the in-situ ground-based data. And that's why in my PhD project, we use the synthetic aperture radar data, which are um, remote sensing data, that's uh, able to provide data regardless of the weather conditions and regardless of the sunlight. 
So we use the uh, circuit decoupler reader data, also the INSAR coherence and the INSAR, the interfer matrix SAR data, uh, in order to provide extra knowledge about the changes that happen on the ground surface due to, to the existence of flood water and also the INSAR uh, uh, interferometric SAR um, antiferograms, which uh, gives us information about the deformations that happen on the ground surface. So we use all this information combined with the uh, computer science knowledge and thematic knowledge of hydrology and geology in order to provide the system that will help the decision makers in the uh, task of uh, flood risk management. And did you use a supervised or unsupervised learning model? Uh, actually, both. <laughs> wow. Both. Yeah, actually, when it comes to uh, flood mapping, the use of the classification approach, the flood mapping approach, it is highly related to the availability of data. For instance, if we do not have a priori data about the flooded zone, then it's better to use unsupervised classification. But when we do have uh, data about the flooded region, then it's better to use the uh, supervised classification. And then you also apply deep learning methods too, right? Yes, actually the deep learning method came after, came when we were thinking about the post-flood ground surface displacement mapping. And actually, we, because we had this problem in uh, the INSAR interferogram um, data, it's not straightforward to distinguish between the noisy part and the useful part. So what we did is that we tried to explore the deep learning capability to have a straightforward method of classification to distinguish the zone that is affected by post-flood deformation and the zone that is only the atmospheric noise. Did you use machine learning too? Actually, I used it in the um, supervised classification context. We used the random forest supervised classification, and it was the need actually it was to overcome the challenges of flood mapping in a complex environment, which means a co an environment that contains dense vegetation and urban zones. Uh, it was actually in the context of mapping the flooding event that happened in Quebec in Canada 2011. Also, in this uh, work, we took advantage from the uh, low temporal decorrelation of the B-static uh, in SAR coherence of uh, tandemic terrestrial data. Actually, also, because for this flooding event, we had a priori data. We had knowledge about the flooded region. So also, we used the simulation of uh, the flood water depth in different dates uh, using the hydraulic model of this flood. So we also used hydraulic modeling for this uh, event combined with the supervised classification of the uh, terrestrial tandemic static data. Wait a second. So the research was not focused on Tunisia's flood-prone regions? We really wanted to work on flooded regions in Tunisia. But the problem is that we had the, this problem of lack of ground truth data. So we couldn't really test our classification approach on real flooding events that happen in Tunisia. So we need to have, for example, the measurements of, of water levels during the flooding event, the flood extent, so we can test if we are really having the exact flood extent using our approach or not. I really would like to apply what I have done in my PhD into a um, real uh, flood risk management tool here in Tunisia. Because I know this is going to help uh, people and it's going to save time and money for my country. <laughs> so I think this is something that I really want to do. That makes sense. Your father must be very proud of your accomplishments. Unfortunately, I lost my father during the second year of my PhD. But I was um, always keeping in mind his words, actually, because he was always telling me to continue my journey no matter what happens. Also, as a researcher, 
I'm deeply grateful to my thesis supervisor, Professor Riyad al Fateh, because he believed in my ability because I came from the background of computer science and he introduced me to the GSS field. Uh, he also gave me uh, valuable advices and opened up for me many, many opportunities. Also, because I, I really want to be grateful here, I want to also say thank you to some excellent researchers with whom I, I have worked. Um, they were experts in the fields of remote sensing and um, hydrology, geology, and they really helped me to combine my computer science knowledge with the requirements of the flood mapping uh, circumstances. I'm so sorry to hear about your father, Shaima, but it is good to know that you have such a wonderful memory of traveling to Canada with him. Yes, thank you. I actually wanted to ask you, what have you learned as a result of traveling? Uh, okay, what I have learned from traveling is that we are all the same. Uh, no matter of my, our origins, or our culture, all of us, we do have the same fears, we do have the same ambitions, all of us, we love our parents, we love our children, so there is no, the basics are the same for all of us. Thanks for sharing that, Shaima, and thank you so much for joining me today. It was really great to have you on this podcast. Thank you, Stephanie. I was really happy also to have this conversation with you. Actually, one of the things that really motivated me to do this podcast is that uh, being a radio announcer was one of my childhood dreams. So I really, I was really motivated to do this podcast because I wanted to live this experience. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we'll hear you on another podcast in the future. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe I will be encouraged to do that after this podcast. Sounds good. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's all for this episode of Down to Earth. For more information about Dr. Shaima Chabani and her research, connect with her on LinkedIn. Please also follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And be sure to send some love to our sponsors at IEEE Win GRSS on Facebook and Twitter and IEEE Women in GRSS on LinkedIn. This episode was produced by Nicole Bedford from Nicole Bedford Films with help from me, Stephanie Tumampos. Graphics and design by Mylene Briggs of Killam Media. And a special thanks to Heather McNairn, Sean Kefauver, and Keely Roth for their support. I'm Stephanie Tumampos, and you've been listening to Down to Earth.